means they need to fulfill all five or four of these requirements. So how does this bill pass the Moran test? Well, the, man the mandates would be eliminated at the federal level, so states uh, could choose to keep the measure, replace it, or get rid of it completely. That would mean younger, healthier people would choose not to be covered, and this would leave older and sicker on health insurance plans, causing the premiums to rise dramatically. By 20%, in some cases, we're waiting for the CBO score. Um, this bill would allow states to waive essential health benefits, so people with pre-existing conditions would see their protections for coverage end. And um, this bill would restructure Medicaid and decrease its funding. That would make it difficult for states to maintain the Medicaid expansion, so rural hospitals would probably close and jobs would be eliminated. Um, uh, which would affect proper care in rural communities. So that's that's what I have. And so whoever wants to, to go with that. Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the big talk talking points on the news from most of the Republicans that we're hearing from is, well, this is so great because this puts the control back in the states. States can, can decide what they want. These states can better manage it. So I worked a lot of years, I dealt with a lot of federal agencies, DOT, EPA, um, MSHA, OSHA, a lot of them. Almost every aspect of our government, the federal Stop government has mandates or guidelines that these, these are the laws that you need to follow. And then the states can, they still have control to change things, but they can't be, you know, they can't be less than what the federal government requires. So this is pretty much saying, we're not gonna give any guidelines. If they take away the mandate, if they take away the um, essential coverage that insurance has to provide, then every state, it's, it's, it's just a wild card what they're going to do. They don't have any, here's the minimum that we're gonna require. This bill doesn't say you have to provide these essential things or saying so they can come up with you know go pick the state you want to live in that has the best insurance coverage well that's that's kind of crazy I mean come on we're not going to move to another state to get our health care and there are people so I work for 21 years for a company and in the economic downturn 55 years old I lost my job our income was cut in half, and my 401k that I diligently put money into uh, when I left had lost 75%. So for, uh, there's no way at 55, which only I've found part-time jobs, nobody's going to hire me. You know, for certainly not the income I was making for. There's no way I'm going to be able to rebuild that retirement to cover health care coverage. If I live long enough, those those protections that we I paid for my entire life are going to eventually be gone. You know, and there's a lot of people that are put into these situations. It's not that we're a bunch of deadbeats, although I'm sure there are deadbeats on Medicaid. You know, there are people that abuse whatever system. Billionaires, you know, abuse the tax system. Poor people are going to abuse some of these, but you can't punish everybody for a few. And I think that's what this bill does. Thank you. I'm going to add to what you okay. said, if you don't mind. Because no, I'm, I'm, a small, I'm in the same boat as I got laid off after sure. 30 years in the field, and we lost two thirds of our income when I got right. laid off. So, mm -hmm. And I was only 50 when I got, when I got yeah. laid off. But so in, in the meantime, I've set up a mobile a, a business where I was operating across state lines. Mm -hmm. And the worst problem that I have is that when you take anything that's, you know, should be federal, federally regulated and drop it down to the state level, mm -hmm. it becomes impossible. I've lived in four states, I've operated in a business in 12 states. I mean, it's the simple things like applying for a driver's license or buying their business license. You have to relearn everything mm -hmm. when you go state to state to state. So, first of all, as an entrepreneur, I have already back, I've already left four states because practices at a state level make it prohibitive for me to operate in multiple states. Mm -hmm. Now, you put that healthcare rules and regulations at that. What's going to happen to the businesses across the country that mm -hmm. operate in multiple mm -hmm. states and have to deal oh, with individually every single different type of law and regulation done at a state level? I mean, 
for just that alone drives cost into healthcare, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it draws cost. It, it, I mean, it, it's healthcare. Yeah, there's issues with our healthcare system, but rather than looking at what's the problems, let's fix the problems so that everybody can benefit. They're just, you know, it's like a partisan, like, you know, oh, we don't like this, let's just repeal it, or yeah. let's replace we, it. We ran on this. Or let's yeah, throw right. it, let's give it, we can't solve the problems, so we're going to give it to the states so and wipe our hands from all of this. It's a disaster. And as somebody with a lot of pre just so I've, I was laid off, but I also have a lot of pre existing well, health sure. conditions I mean, that are genetically yeah. based. I mean, they were, if, if this law goes through, I'm basically dead in five years. So this is a, this is a life changing issue for people. So if, if a CBO score is required for Moran to vote yes on this bill and he said he's going to do that, well, then he, he can't vote because they don't have time for a CBO score. And I wrote up my comments. He'll pass that on to him. Sorry if I interrupted you. Could I? No, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Can I go ahead or let him answer that question? <clears throat> let him answer the question about the CBO. If you score. can't get a full CBO score in two weeks, how are we going to vote? Yes, well, we're going to we're going to vote and we'll take a, we'll take into consideration. I mean, we'll see what they come out with on Monday or Tuesday. I know it's going to be a slim CBO score. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> see what they say. Thanks. I think you can, you can make an argument. Sorry, you can make an argument that a generous reading of the existing bill is as bad or worse than the bill that I honestly was very proud to see Moran stand up and say, "I'm not voting for this." Yes, I think very all much of us so. yes. Yes. agree. Yes. 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 yes, but um, do you? I mean, honestly, the public page. I, I would be shocked at the CBD. So well, this is so much better than the BCRA. Not very likely. We have to. Admit yeah, that. Oh, no. the generous read would be it'd be as bad. So is the senator going to use the same criteria he used the last time when he voted no when looking at this bill? We we have seen senators show, you know, I'm sorry, uh, what, what you had, Brad, and that's some of the criteria. That is the criteria. Okay. So, so those criteria have not changed. Okay. Well, okay. <clears throat> Because I, I, I am confused. I'll be honest. <laughs> I'm very confused with where Senator Moran is on his position. I do have a letter for him, which okay. I'm going to give to you, Alex. But if it would be okay with everybody else, may I read? Because I'm better with my thoughts organized on paper than I am extemporaneously. Um, I am. I've got a copy. So here, here is the copy for Senator Moran. Is And I wrote another letter in July. I'm writing to voice my strong opposition to the Graham Cassidy ACA repeal bill. Like the majority of Americans, 71% as reported by Kaiser Family Foundation in July, I would prefer the ACA be improved in a bipartisan manner rather than be repealed. We had a promising opportunity with the bill Senators Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray were preparing, but regrettably that has been tabled. Sorry. Um, now, on July 31st, after the first or the last failed attempt, Senator Moran stated that it's clear that, quote, the process used to develop the health care legislation we considered last week was flawed. I'll skip some things down. It's important that to maintain safeguards for pre existing conditions, protect the elderly and those with disabilities, and lower costs for all Kansans. I hope we can do better if we put politics aside and allow the full legislative. Those are those two words, and I'm still trying to wrap my understanding how Senator Moran understands full legislative process. Because the way I looked at it, when you voted last time, that wasn't a full legislative process. And I've asked questions, and I, and I, and I know you all are very busy in your offices, but I'm trying to understand, and I still don't understand how that's interpreted. But let me go on, and I'm going to be kind of piggybacking on what some other people have said here. The repeal and replace mantra is a very catchy phrase to get reelected. But I fear it's made you, Senator Moran, and your colleagues blind to the implications of such a move on your constituents' lives. Right. Yep. The Graham Cassidy bill destroys Medicaid as we know it by turning Medicaid into a capped system. It hurts children with disabilities, the elderly, and even victims of natural disasters 
like the recent hurricanes, but more closer to home, like the Great Flood of 1993, the 2007 Greensburg tornado, and the 2017 Kansas wildfires. It also takes away funding to help people afford health insurance through the marketplace. What's more, it puts in jeopardy popular components, and these are popular across party lines. Components of the ACC, ACA, such as the essential health benefits, as well as protection for pre-existing conditions. That, again, I remind Senator Brand, you say you want maintained. I was a speech language pathologist in the public schools for 32 years, and many of my students and families rely on Medicaid for their services. And I also have a dear friend whose adult sister is handicapped and is very dependent upon Medicaid to help with her living and medical expenses in a skilled nursing facility. Now, also, I'm reminding Senator Moran that you described the legislative process this summer as being flawed. Well, I maintain the current rushed attempt is far worse. I remind you that a number of governors and nonpartisan health care organizations, such as Blue Cross Blue Shield, the American Medical Association, the American Cancer Society, American Heart Association, and AARP have already come out against this bill. Should the Graham Cassidy bill come to a vote, it will be after one sham hearing, because I understand there's going to be a hearing next week, but it's going to be a sham yep. to make it look like it's a full process. And it will be totally partisan, totally partisan, which again, he says we want both sides and we'll have an incomplete CPO score. When a consumer takes a car or home loan, takes, the, takes one out, federal law requires that the lender provide a full financial disclosure. Voting for the Graham Cassidy repeal bill without knowing all its possible impacts on your constituents' lives is both reckless and irresponsible. It's playing Russian roulette with people's lives. Finally, you claim to be looking out for Kansas' best interests, but this bill clearly does not do that. I urge you to vote no on the Graham Cassidy bill and prove to your constituents that you value them over your party. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for passing that on. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add something real quick on what they were talking about on giving uh, Medicaid back to the states to administer and, and help uh, programs to the state. <clears throat> if Senator Moran really has the best interest of us Kansas constituents in his, in, his, in his heart, then he only needs to look at what this legislature has done to the Medicaid that's being administered right now. Yeah. The horrific problems that are going on with can care, the long lines, the long uh, waiting lists, on the disability for people to get disability services through Medicaid. And if he wants to look at how Kansas operates with some of their programs, look at the Department of Family Services where we have hundreds of kids sleeping in social workers' offices, I guess, instead of being in foster placement. All kinds of trouble with that system. The last thing I think we want is for Kansas to take over total medical uh, operations. For Amen. Thank you. Yes, especially with the <coughs> and, and just one other question I have when we're talking about states control. This is something related to, to, to where we want to go back to states' rights. I, I, I mentioned this to Senator Moran regarding education. We're a mobile society. What are the impacts when somebody takes themselves and moves to another yeah. state? Because their job is going to take them somewhere else when the whole different set of rules, rules apply for insurance. Okay. I, I brought a point in mind that I didn't cover. Okay. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I'd like to add as far as like the concern of the state's ability to be able to manage a program like that, and particularly with block grant funding, yeah. and uh, carries that on to the precarious financial situation that the state of Kansas is, is in. Yeah. I don't see that those two measures work very, uh, very well together particularly when they, the state is pretty much free to use that money in any manner that they want, as long as it has some health Sorry. associated uh, name to it, doesn't necessarily mean that it goes to providing direct health benefits. And um, uh, and then the fact that over time, the, the 
the money that will actually be coming into the states will continue to be reduced. And so then the states will be forced then to either find funding some other way or continue to cut the programs. Thank you. Um, I have a letter also. Um, this is to Senator Moran. You wrote to me that the full legislative process with expert hearings, expert witness testimony, and a free exchange of ideas and amendments would result in a better health care solution. This has not yet taken place for the Graham-Cassidy bill. Will it in the next nine days? You wrote to me that the Senate will now move toward an approach that includes holding hearings and the relevant committees and attempting to find real fixes to the problems that vex our health care system. Has this happened? What were the specific results? You wrote to me that you wanted to keep rural hospital doors open, maintain safe safeguards for pre-existing conditions, protect the elderly, and those with disabilities and lower cost for all Kansans. How does the Graham-Cassidy bill do this? Um, you wrote to me that decisions made regarding health care have real consequences for Kansas and their families. I couldn't agree more. If you can't fully answer my questions, provide research and evidence supporting your answers, or elicit the support of any healthcare group, be it from caregivers, hospitals, patient advocacy groups, or the insurance industry, you should vote no on the Graham Cassidy bill. Yes. Thank you. Today, speaking as a mom, my son Danny Robeson is five years old and he's medically fragile. He has cerebral palsy and epilepsy. And you know, I've been here before to talk about his health care and his needs. And I'm not sure why in this country we're asking mothers to justify why it is important to keep their children alive. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to keep coming here? to ask Senator Moran to protect my son's health and life. It's, you know, having a child with a disability is stressful enough, it's hard enough, but we push on and we live our lives like anybody else. We, we go, he goes to school, we're out and about, we're everywhere in our community, we're proud of him and we have, I have, I have no regrets about his life and who he is. Um, but what makes that possible is health care. What makes that possible is Medicaid. And the cuts in this bill will devastate us and families around this country. So I would ask Senator Moran to think about children, to think about the real human impact of this bill, and to think of us before party, before promises, before before anything else, and to protect the kids of this country, to protect people like Danny Robeson. Thank you. Um, I'll say a word. I'm uh, representing National Nurses United today, and um, I'm I'm, I want to say a couple things. First of all, rural hospitals, I'm from a rural area, Whitson County, are in danger. They're already in trouble. We lost one in Independence. We've come, we're close to losing the one in Eureka. One in Topeka had to be saved already this year. So we're really feeling that in a very personal way. Those people in Independence have to travel over an hour to get to emergency care. And if you're a healthcare provider, you know that first hour after a heart attack or a stroke is golden. It's your big opportunity to help somebody. And um, this week, National Nurses United, or actually a couple of days ago, uh, did a press release on this very amendment, the, the Cassidy Graham Amendment. And I'm just going to read you the last paragraph from it. We have a health care crisis in this country. We see it every single day at the hospital bedside. Patients can't afford to see the doctor. They can't afford their medications. They can't afford life-saving treatment. As a result, people suffer needlessly. The Graham-Cassidy Amendment will make this even worse than it already is. 
the Senate should reject this heartless proposal and instead pass Medicare for all. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. We got here a little bit late. But, um, this bill seems to do nothing to address this this skyrocketing cost of health care in this country, as with all the other bills that the House and Senate have tried to ram through Congress this past summer. When are they going to address that? That you know that that should be the the number one priority, I would think, is is finding a way to bring the cost down um, instead of uh, you know shifting. To the states, doing all of, you know, sort of this shell game thing, which means most of us, including my husband and myself, who are self-employed, and we we buy our insurance through the exchange because we don't have another option. Um, this bill is going to price us out of the market. You know, we're we're in our late fifties. Uh, we're we're too many years away from Medicare right now. I'm not even sure Medicare will will be there. I'm so far, that doesn't seem to have been touched, but we have to believe if Congress is going after Medicaid, Medicare can't be far behind. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know from Senator Moran, what are you doing to address the, the costs? Um, I, I will say that uh, one thing he has been saying a lot of times when he's talking is that uh, we have focused on who's paying for it, how is this getting paid, should we have universal coverage, mm -hmm. and we do need to focus on cost of health care. And uh, before we had Obamacare and before we had all this sort of stuff, he did have a template plan, it's on our website, that would help drive down cost. And, and, and it's his frustration that none of these bills and none of these health care measures, it's all been about who's paying for it. And we do need to get to the underlying, uh, underlying uh, reasons for the rise of health care. And we have it on the website. I'm happy to show it to you. It's uh, something he's had for a while, um, saying these are the things he would propose to do to get, not not who paid for it, Medicare for All or anything mm -hmm. like that, but how, how do we get health care costs down because okay, that's but a that, large driver. And, and I have looked at that before. I just I don't see any of that in, in the legislation that's being being pushed. It hasn't been, and, and, and that's one of the things we've been talking about. Okay. And all, in all the legislation, Healthcare legislation. Nobody has touched the underlying cost of healthcare. Exactly. Don't disagree with you. Yeah. The way that could be addressed, if he voted no, right. yes. <laughs> stop this, right. so they oh, could. Let's do it right. Yeah, do it right. Yeah, right. It's problem solving 101. I mean, it, <laughs> and he travels around the state and visits all of the you know, hospitals and things like that. And he tries to do analysis on the problem and fix the problem. No, just partisanship through the, well, we've been saying repeal for eight years, let's go do it now. The thing, you know, the thing it doesn't, doesn't add, solve anything. Is that, you know, I'm, I'm always going to appeal, I'm always going to appeal to his sense of history and his sense of legacy, and I will always say, and every time I call, I always say I went to his, I went to his town hall meeting in Lenexa, and that my opinion of him was very high. And because I believed him, and perhaps he missed his calling and he needs to become an actor, because I really did believe him, that I believed he wanted to do the right thing, and he has an opportunity to do that. None of us in this room were elected to Congress. We don't have the ability, we don't have the power individually in this room to stop the mess that's happening right now in Washington, D.C. He has the power. He can put the brakes on this. If he's got this 10-point plan, he's a senator. Tell him to scream and yell and shout. Us screaming and yelling and shouting here to four has not really helped because he continues to vote for these things. If he, I, I believe underneath that he's a decent guy. And I really hate thinking that I misread him. Somebody coming in. I, I really hate thinking that maybe he really just pulled the wool over all of our eyes and went up. Because I really think underneath that he wants to be a good guy. Mm -hmm. So I would I would hope, come on in, that he would vote. I, I really think he, he would be voting his conscience if he didn't vote for this. I, and maybe I'm just fooled. Maybe I'm just an optimist and I was just fooled by him. But he's got to know this isn't a good plan. I came in a little late, so these points may have been addressed, but I think they're really important. In the in the healthcare bill that, that got up right now, the the mantra is that fifty states can do better job than one, <laughs> one unified country. No. And that's saying like um, you know, this is a major part of our economy. And if a major corporation in the US suddenly decided that the best way to deal with all its suppliers and providers would be to separate itself into fifty units and negotiate <laughs> perhaps against itself. Um, it, it, 
would they'd be giving up all their leverage, all their power of uh, one big organized group. Are there Republicans the, that desperate for a win that they're going to do this? And the second point, the second point is, <laughs> for those of us who live in Kansas, the idea that the U.S. Congress would be turning us over to the tender mercies of someone like Sam Brownback mm -hmm. to decide who gets health care and who doesn't is frightening. Yes. Yeah, he, he would lose a lot. A lot of people would leave the state, Thank you. and I would be one of those. I just have a little something to share. I think one mistake that's been made is that we look at health care costs as one thing, and it's really very different. The cost of for children and the things that are needed for children to be healthy are completely different than somebody like me is looking for. Um, for me, it's prescription drug costs. It's, I mean, I'm honestly not taking medication that would make my life better because I can't afford it. It's $500 for every three months. Um, forget it, I'm not gonna spend that kind of money. So I end up uncomfortable. It's not a, a big, huge health risk, but it's definitely an uncomfortable situation. Um, I th I think we need to look at it in more detail down an analysis of really what's down below instead of just calling it health care costs. And if I could add to that, what you're saying, mm -hmm. uh, we go back to the children. Uh, I used to work for the Arthritis Foundation. And by the way, Major Moran was a great supporter of uh, the Arthritis Foundation and its research. And um, we had kids 40 years ago at national conference, they were in wheelchairs around the room. And we go to a national conference now, no wheelchairs, because these kids are able to live a normal life and they're productive. But if they have, have no health care, then you know what happens to people that have arthritis that do not get treatment, like rheumatoid arthritis? Bed death, bed death. If I didn't take my arthritis medication, I couldn't get out of bed. That's, and I know it every time I have to have surgery, go off my medication, I can't get out of bed. And that's what we're telling these kids. Thank you, Pat. Uh, who was at the uh, the town hall in Lenox in June? I was in Topeka. Do you all, do you remember the senator saying that he wouldn't vote on something if there wasn't an open debate or information about it? I want to know if the senator still stands by that. Uh, that statement. He did, yeah. I remember. I took pictures yeah. of all the green cards in the air. He yeah. stands by everything he said. On so we vote for this if it comes up for a vote next week? I'm not going to speak for the senator. Before there's we're still open getting, discussion? We're still getting all sorts of information and, uh, and all sorts of input. We we don't have we're meeting with y'all. We don't have the uh, report from uh, CBO? It does, it's supposed to not, it doesn't even have time to do a full report. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, exactly. The, the senator in June, in front of those of us that raised our hands and, and hundreds of other people, promised he wouldn't vote for something that there wasn't adequate information and open debate about. He did vote. He voted. He the skinny. Other vote last vote. That's correct. So he's broken that at least once. Okay. And the other senators are talking about, you know, well, we have a deadline. You know, and Robert said, well, we're in a car going off a cliff, so we have to take whatever car is available, and that's nonsense. You know, no. they can't do it just because they have a debt. Don't they have pride in America that we can come up with something better? They, if they could come up with something that the Democrats would also support, that something, what's the word for that? Bipartisanship? And they need bipartisanship in two weeks, and that's what they're trying to avoid. Regardless of what happens, I think if he believes that we need to continue if this thing fails next week or if it passes, we, we do need to continue trying to work on this and get bipartisan consensus on health care. But well, certainly, do you think it'll fail? Is that no, I have no idea. <laughs> nice try there. Thank you. No. <laughs> no. I, have not I know you're trying to do it. <laughs> no. But even if this bill does not pass, if, if, if this does fail, this isn't the, the end of the world as far as, uh, you know, health care. We still have the ACA. It's still in place. There is still an enrollment period coming up, even though the Trump administration is trying not to advertise it, but there is. And, you know, we can try to let that law work as it's supposed to be without um, interference and people trying to sabotage it, as they seem to be. 
And then in the meantime, maybe in the next session, you know, after the uh, first of the year, then maybe since there has been some talk of bipartisan support in both um, chambers of Congress to come up with, with plans to fix the ACA, to, to shore it up, to fix the problems in, in it, and you know, then we don't have to go through this every so many months that you know we're we're being threatened with you know taking our health care away. Um, I mean, you know, we're on on maintenance medications too, and, and like our friend here, we're we're also worried about um, skyrocketing costs if this uh, you know if the ACA goes away. How are we going to you know be able to pay for our our drugs? And right now, I'm not on a uh, Xanax or anything like that, but you keep doing this, <laughs> and I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. So you there'll know. be a DSF five <laughs> healthcare insecurity anxiety <laughs> <laughs> diagnosis. <laughs> and as I mentioned Speaking before, we had the Murray Alexander bill <laughs> yeah. that was already started in the Senate exactly between a Democrat and Republican. And for those of you who are for the Medicare for all, don't get me wrong. I'm there with you, ultimately. But I am saying there's going to be a transition. There's going to be a transition. There has to be a transition um, in reality. And a reminder. Yeah. I'm with you, though. But I, I just, OK. And that my, my only other question is, I know this free market health care. <laughs> No one has satisfactorily ever explained to me how free market can bring health care costs down when you throw out the individual mandate. No insurance company is going to insure risky people who are the sick. Anyone They're not the going to. You need everyone in the pool to bring the cost down. It's the same, that's why we have auto insurance, Well, we all have to pay for car insurance. And it doesn't weaken our society, it strengthens it. <laughs> It'll strengthen our country. It will not diminish it. I don't want to live in a nation of sick people. I want people to be healthy. Well, because society is going to pay the cost for that, mm -hmm. but you pay for it up front with providing some type of affordable health care or even pay it on the back end with a whole with a great number of disabled, really ill people who can't be productive. Pulling out well right. pulling out more on public services, just trying to uh, uh, have a life within our society. So it, it it's a conundrum for sure. But most everybody knows that it's a lot less expensive to fix something before it gets too broken mm -hmm. than it is trying to come in on the back end and fix catastrophic health issues when they could have been stopped early on with preventative preventative care and essential health services. Which has been shown to work under the ACA mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with preventative care. I'd also like to add to the point about getting to the root cause of the increasing cause of, cost of health care and prescription drugs. Unless that is addressed and finding some way of solution, Medicare is not, not stable enough to provide even for existing beneficiaries. And the increase in health uh, in prescription drugs it makes it even cost prohibitive for those uh, that have prescription D coverage or Medicare Part D uh, because of how that, that program is structured. And sometimes uh, I know I have one medication that if it weren't for my prescription drug coverage that I do have, it costs a thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And that, that would choke anybody's budget. I don't care how financially stable that you are. And I think of all my friends that have rheumatoid arthritis as well. And uh, their, their prescription, their medications can cost $1,500 an injection or more. So I, I do agree that there is some type of a health care <coughs> program that should, we should be able to find as a nation of good thought leaders and willing to work together. But we also have to address, like people are saying, the fundamental cost fundamental reasons for the increased cost in health care and including prescription drugs. 
And thank you. Uh, Jerry Moran has spoken at both uh, two town halls that I attended, one in Junction City and one in Topeka, about increasing regulation of, of medical costs. So we do have some degree of an ally here. Also, I'd like to add, also I'd like to add that uh, as far as can what Kansas wants, Kansas has voted twice to expand uh, Medicaid. And under the Graham-Cassidy uh, bill, uh, Medicaid expansion will be ended. So therefore, this, uh, this bill is not what well, good for Kansas or what Kansas wants. And I'm Brendan Beyer from Topeka, Indivisible. <clears throat> well, in Medicaid, the way that it works now, it's based on need. Um, so anytime you do a block grant or a cap, you're going to have to end up in a situation where you're going to triage and where her son is going to end up getting it and say my daughter wouldn't because she's not medically fragile, but it would affect her because she would no longer be able to get her psychiatric meds. And then she wouldn't be able to function in society and could end up being hospitalized or in jail. It's rationing and it's death penalties. It's, yes, it's rationing and it's death panels, and it's not now. The way that Medicaid works now, it is based on how sick people are and what they need. And that's how the federal government decides how much money to put into it. You know, even the Medicaid that's not expanded. It's based on needs. It's not based on a certain amount of money, and then you have to work around that. Well, if you do that, you will end up with people who are not getting what they need. Not in the richest country in the world, supposedly. Yes. We be dealing with this. And Medicaid now is for people who are not making enough money or are really, really sick, you know, or really, really old and they run through all their life's resources and they're now in a nursing home. That's how you pay for the nursing home after you paid off paid off everything with everything that you have. So these are people who are priced out of the free market. There is no way they can get it anywhere else. And they want to put a limit on that that is artificial and unnecessary. I'd like to speak up about the free market issue. As a lifetime Republican, of course, I'm into free markets. What happened to me Welcome. in the free market is I had a private policy through Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I broke my shoulder. That treatment was two visits to the doctor and two images. Healed completely on its own. No Band-Aids, no Tylenol, no sling or anything. Three weeks after that, I was taken off of Blue Cross Blue Shield for pre-existing conditions. I was riding my bike 10 miles to work and back. For years, I, rode five, I ran five miles a day. I never smoked a cigarette in my whole life. In the free market, Sorry. I was taken off of my private insurance policy. In the free market, I was also allowed to work 39 and a half hours a week at Johnson County Community College without getting any benefits. Mm -hmm. 39 and a half hours a week. So very begrudgingly, after I was kicked off of my insurance policy and went without any health insurance for a year, I had signed up for ACA. It has been the best insurance that I've ever had. And what is happening to me now is that as a 52-year-old woman who has worked off and on in the workforce and so forth, my husband is full-time in a wheelchair with multiple sclerosis, and I'm his primary caregiver. He is a contract employee with a local financial firm here, so he doesn't get benefits for the family. So where does that leave me? In the free marketplace, they're going to kick me off for something that healed itself. I have no options. And so what do I do? Maybe go to work at Costco from the 10 to 4 a.m. shift so I can continue to provide care for my husband? So I am telling you that the Republicans have left me and my family in the dust and they don't care. And I'm going to go to the voting booths and express my opinion when it comes time. I'm expressing it now in the hopes that they understand that they can't just throw us all under the bus. I've already started working on a Democratic Congresswoman's campaign for 2018. And I have been registered as a Republican since 1983. I have never voted off the party ticket until 2016. Thank you. So we are paying attention to what's happening and the way the Republican Party is going completely off the rails. Wow. And we're noticing it. Thank and you. I wish you would I don't know what to do. If that goes away, I already know the free market won't insure me. And I don't have cancer. I don't have MS. I broke a bone. Healthy people fill jobs. <laughs> me too. And I ride bike MS 100 miles one day and 75 miles the next day to raise money for a cure. And I'm unsure in the free market. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I don't want to expanding on that. But I think 
you know, I've read a few senators have acknowledged that this is not a good bill. Pat Roberts did. Yeah. But he said, if, I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing, if we want to keep the gavel in 2018, we have yes. to vote for it. <laughs> and there's also uh, information out there that Koch brothers have said they will be keeping their money for 2018 if this does not pass. So to me, it's just saying we're trying, we want money from the Koch brothers and all our big donors. We want to say we repealed and replaced. That's it. I mean, there's no, there is no, uh, there's no thought of what this is going to do to people. They know, the people that are saying it's a good bill, as Jimmy Kimmel yes. has shown, are lying. They are lying. To our faces. To our faces. Yeah. They go on TV and they lie. Thank God for Jimmy, who is getting it out there to kind of the average viewer, the one that's not on Twitter and mm -hmm. following everything, that these people are lying to you. This is going to hurt you. And they don't care. They just want to get reelected. They want their Koch brother money. They want their big donor money. And they want to give their tax breaks to their rich donors. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's well, all it's about. It's I not, think, not health care. I think it's a miscalculation for them to believe that passing this bill would mm -hmm. allow them to keep the gavel. I think if they pass a bill that throws millions of people off of health insurance, that's the fact fastest way to losing their majority in both houses. Here's a, a Republican right here who is not voting Republican anymore. I mean, she's not the only one. So, um, you know, I, I think that's something they really should think about. This, this is, if there is one issue in this country that unites people of all mm -hmm. different political stripes, this is it. This is the one. It's, it's the whole health care thing. This is the thing that all of us have to deal with. And I think the Republicans really need to think long and hard about that. They vote for Cassidy Graham, you're voting for me to die. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be blunt about it because people are afraid to use the kill me, you know, die and death. Right. Afraid. But you know what? You're gonna kill me. He votes for it, I die. <clears throat> Period. Yeah. So I emotional about it? Yes. Yes. I want to live. <laughs> Lynn Jenkins staffers got very um, uptight the first time that I met with them because I used the phrase premeditated murder. <laughs> and I understand that that's a little dramatic, but I think it's also accurate. They need to know their power. Yeah. <laughs> so they can feel it more effectively. No, that's not good. <laughs> I'd just like to say, I really get the sense that also, like someone I'll just love said, that he is a good man. Um, I don't politically, I mean, I'm a Democrat lifelong, but I, I went to the Topeka Town Hall and I told him that personally, that for him to stand up, and I'm going to get emotional, to the bigots, or the, uh, including our president and the racists over the Charlottesville deal, for him to be one of the first Republicans to come out with a comment made me incredibly proud. And I know that he's struggling with this. I really empathized with the uh, with the pressure that he has got to be under with this decision. But you know, we're begging him to do the right thing, not the politically correct thing. And I know it won't be easy for him. I think for some, it's very easy. But I just want to pass on and appreciate that he does struggle with this. And he's in the majority with people feeling this way. <clears throat> he's in the majority. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to say, as a Republican, I have not left my party. Um, I'm still look I'm looking for courage in my Republican leaders. I'm looking yeah. for what I thought I voted for. I voted for Jerry Moran every time I've had an option to. So I'm looking for courage. I'm looking for my Republican leaders to represent me and do the right thing. I really am. Thank you. We would like more men of principle besides John McCain if this comes to a vote. And women. But I'm just saying on this vote, I'm counting on this vote, he was. As well as uh, Murkowski and um, Collins. As well as one other last point. We were talking about all of this new bill. Has any woman been on the planning committee for this Graham Cassidy mm -hmm. bill? They weren't on the Because I knew they weren't on the others. Mm -hmm. Has there been any input from women great. senators? <laughs> okay. I don't know. Good. Pan, 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 oh, I, I mean, I, I don't. I, I'm, that I'm is another. Of, that I'm is not another part of negative. The thing. I don't this, know yeah, but just, write, just yeah. write that down. That's one of no. my again. 
I can probably Pointing. vouch for most of the women in this group. Yes. But this is this is yeah. totally. It's, well, it's Graham and Cassidy, and then they had they had advice from Rick Santorum. <laughs> oh no! Uh, well, then never mind. I know. I answered. You answered my question. Yeah, with that last. And I do. I wanted to address a little bit about the women's health care in this bill. Um, I was looking at a Forbes article, so that's my source, and it talked about what different um, pre-existing conditions would cost different people. And I wish I had the exact figure. I don't. But the last one on was a completed pregnancy with no or minor uh, complications. difficulties, complications. How can a completed pregnancy be a pre-existing condition? To this date, every human being who's <laughs> been born in the United States of America has been born of a woman. So how does that count against us? How does that count against us? I have I've given birth to three children. I have seven in my blended family. That is so wrong to say that every woman who has provided a human being for our country has to pay more. And if you weren't giving birth to children, you'd be using birth control, which is also not allowed. You know, a lot of so I, that is just really terrible. I mean, what, are we gonna start buying those sacks so we don't have to have pre-existing conditions? As Susie Orman used to say all the time, I don't know if she still does, if she's still around. <laughs> People first, money, then things. And I always thought that was such a pithy, great line from her. You gotta take care of people first. And uh, the money is there, we're just not prioritizing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of the, um, what is it, the defense? We don't need your war machines. <laughs> Statistically, having a couple of kids makes you feel like Actually, well, that's science. It actually helps a mess. Yeah. Helps a mess. Yeah. If you're only with a mess and having a baby, yeah. it helps you. Hmm. So also with rheumatoid arthritis. Is that or because it's anti-inflammatory and all that? See, that's again. Yep. Can I also add one thing about one of the other big talking points they like say is that you know we want to change this because it gives people more options, it gives people more choices. In reality, we don't really have any choices. We just have what gets offered to us by the insurance companies. Yep. They're the ones who have the choice, and they're the ones that make the decisions. You know, I don't know how many of you have to uh, have to get something pre-approved before I can go in yeah. and get it done, and they can come back and tell you no. The insurance companies tell us how our insurance is going to be managed, and they want to get rid of those essential benefits because that affects their bottom line when they're told, but you have to cover at least this. And, and that they, will affect not only those of us who buy our insurance through the ACA, but people who have yes. employer-based insurance. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's yes. And that's, that's something I think hasn't really <coughs> been brought up very much, but it should be. People who have employer-based insurance mm -hmm. may think yeah. they're safe, but, uh, from, but they're not. I, I already fight insurance companies at least three times a year. Um, I need the doctors prescribing yes. this, and they will not cover it. So I have to fight the insurance company. To your company point, if you're, a, if you're a company executive and you're deciding what health plan to get for employees, and there are no restrictions on um, what the insurance company can offer, mm -hmm. and you're getting crunched by the health costs and your profits are going down, mm -hmm. you are going to probably be forced to go with that bare bones yep. insurance right. mm -hmm. package yeah. that yeah. is insurance in name only. Right. And if the employer mandate goes away, then you may decide, I'm just not going to offer it to my employees yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. And then they will have to go on the exchange if there is yeah. one like the rest of us. Does everyone hear the phones have been ringing the entire time we've been in here? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Also, you're going to lose pastors. My sister's a pastor, and oh. uh, the churches are not providing health care for pastors. So people are getting out of the ministry because they don't have health care. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Laying on their hands doesn't always work. Can I add one more thing? Yeah. Please. I called Senator Roberts' office and I called Senator Moran's office. Yes. And I just want to tell you that you guys are so polite. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So yes. Polite. yes. And that okay. is not and the case with Joe or, or, or Roberts' office. They call police. I mean, yeah. and I can call and rant sometimes. <laughs> and they've been very, very good. And I appreciate that. All, right. All I can say is our, our marching orders are, you know, they're, they're you all, we work for you all. And we're, we're Kansans. And, in DC and here, and we want to hear what people have to say. Okay, thank you. Jan? Do you have any questions for us yeah. that you think you I, could take back or that you've been wondering about? No, I mean, I, I, I know I've been quiet. It's because we want to hear from you all. We want to, we want to learn. 
Uh, I will say that, you know, we do advise the boss and we, we tell him stuff. And, uh, I'll tell him that we have some of the same experiences you have. I have MS. I've had it for seven years. My wife's gone through the same thing. I don't talk about it, but my boss will ask about it. So, do you mind me asking how old you are? I am 38, so I'll be 39. Right. So, That's I, about you know, the time that my husband. Uh, I, I got diagnosed at 30, yes. Um, he but, was that long ago. Yeah, uh, I got lucky. I got access to the pharmaceuticals. So, you know, we all, you know, I'm not bringing out me, but all our mm -hmm. staff, we've had experiences. Mm -hmm. And the boss, whether he has, he does care, and at least in my experience, he asks about it and he learns from it. And that's, you know, just so you know, that's, I wasn't going to talk about it, but that's some of the stuff that goes into it. That's nice. I think it's sure. nice to know. Yeah. That took courage. And are you on the ACA? I would have been on the ACA, uh, and my insurance, uh, um, especially for my medication, would have gone up significantly to the point where it was a lot. Um, all the members, staff members, got sent to the ACA. Uh, my wife decided to, after having a kid, to keep on working and. Oh, okay, through, so you're on we through employer base. But yeah. she made that. She, yeah, you know, that was a, that was another major thing. Hey, we can get employer base. I want to stay home with my kids, but we can't really afford it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, and she can't leave her job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. She moved all the way to Kansas for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> has to stay with her job. <laughs> but you know that's why it's a, one yeah. of the reasons why it's so bad to tie old marriages together yep. in terms of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's just another way that the employers keep you under their thumb. Because I also have a pre existing condition. I've said before, I have type 1 diabetes. And if I wasn't married and my husband had insurance through his job, um, I recently got laid off. So um, I would be on the hook for my own insulin with very little discount. And yikes, I would <laughs> run through my uh, accounts. Pretty and then if there's a lifetime cap, yeah, you might not be able to get insurance at all. I would have to beg on the internet, like many people do. Mm -hmm. Go find them. Sorry. Anything else I need to get to the boss? We're really just looking for courage. Yeah, you know, yeah. Right yeah. Thing to do. He did it one day. Yeah. 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 He did it one day. He did it one day. He did it one day. He did it Healthcare above care, peer pressure. <laughs> 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 Even if all the other senators are doing it, it doesn't mean he needs to. <laughs> I think they're looking for someone to step up. Be Say they're voting no, so they can all go away. Yeah, we're going to vote no. I think it just takes a few with courage to start it, and they'll all be like, yeah, yeah, we're going to Well, the last time Senator Moran was make, making statements, where he wasn't quite on board, suddenly there was a you know, fracture in the whole yeah. caucus, and it they was, were it oh, was, it was and awesome they, to see. yeah, and before he, he pulled out of that, you know, it looked like more people were going to join him. I think he could be a real leader in this thing if he wanted to. He could. You know, I know what's right. Yeah. So he leads them, he's yeah, basically helping our state and leading Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex.